will. Romans chapter number 9. And uh, we're going to start uh, section number 3 today, uh, this morning. And uh, as we have been doing in our other sessions, as we come to the sec- other sections, we'll do an overview this morning, uh, really of uh, chapter 9, but we'll talk a little bit about 10 and 11 as well, because we're coming now to a section of um, where Paul is going to begin to deal with some historical information as well as some dispensational information. And it's really kind of an interesting thing here um, because as you come into 9, if you look at 9-1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not, my conscience also bearing me witness in the Holy Ghost that I have great heaviness and continual sorrow in my heart, for I would could wish that myself were accursed from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. So he's going to talk here about the nation of Israel now. And usually what happens when you come into chapter 9, 10, and 11, everybody skips it. If, look at chapter, get chapter 8, verse 39 and get chapter 12 and verse 1. Okay, 12, 1 and 8, 39. 12, 1 and 8, 39. 8, 39 just ends, nor height, nor depth, nor any other creature shall be able to separate us from the love of God which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. 12, 1, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that ye present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. You see, 839 and 121 link in real natural. It's a natural transition. So what in the world is Paul doing with 9, 10, and 11? And thus, people tend to skip it. They will go into chapter 9, and they'll go into chapter 10. If you look in chapter 10 there, verse 9, that if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, Thou shalt be saved. And so they go in there, oh, you got to have a confession. And they start cherry picking things out of the section to put in some really unorthodox viewpoints. They go into chapter 11, and you, they start talking about the grafting thing, grafting in, grafting out. All, and they, they really just kind of butcher the section when in reality what Paul's going to do here is he's looking at some historical and dispensational issues that are actually very critical for you and I to grasp. And, and we're gonna, I'm going to say what I just said over again, but we're, as we go through this, as we begin looking here, Paul is going gonna, gonna to cover some ground that is really very critical for us to grasp and to get. Okay, And as we started the book of Romans, we... You have to remember, the book of Romans is a legal treatise. We're in a courtroom. If you think about a courtroom setting, uh, you think about Paul as the lead prosecuting attorney, prosecuting humanity. That's what he's doing, all of it. God sits there. He's prosecuting. Paul's literally prosecuting God's, God's case against humanity. The first five chapters, the issue of, what is humanity? Sinners. What do they need? A savior. They need help. So you have the issues of justification. That's why in chapter 3 there, and toward the end, he just says, enough. Shut up. I've had it with you. Here's the, end. Here's the conclusion. You're guilty. All the world is guilty. So, And then in chapter 4 and 5, we find out about the issue of faith and, and so forth, and even in chapter 3. So he lays out the case against humanity and the fact that God, the same God that's judging humanity as a sinner, has also now turned over here and said, here's the answer, my son's going to take your place, and gives the remedy. Then in chapter 6, 7, and 8, Paul's prosecuting the case on behalf of the believer against the adversary. If you think about what we just studied in Romans 8 about who, can be, who, who is against us, Who's for us? If God be for us, well, he's not our cheerleader. What has God done? He's provided resources for us. He's equipped us to handle the details of life. When suffering comes, it comes because of our connection here to the earth. 
and the corrupted, the bondage of corruption. But then in, in chapter 8, verse 35 to the end, we find out that we are also going to suffer because of who we are in Christ. So in chapter 6, 7, and 8, Paul, Paul prosecutes the case about our identification. Here's who you are. You're dead to sin, chapter 6, and alive unto God. You're, chapter 7, dead to the law. Get into the, get into the ministry of grace and the message of grace, and you're alive unto the Father. Then in chapter 8, you're dead to that flesh, so let's be alive in who you are in Christ. And, and so there's identification truths that have been hammered home. So now, in chapter 9, 10, and 11, again, Paul's prosecuting the case here. And he's demonstrating the, some facts here that when you... He's going to give us a number of objections and a number of accusations, really, against God, and a number of, of objections against God himself that has been raised because of what Paul is preaching. Okay? All right? We're going to develop that. So what Paul's going to do in 9, 10, and 11 is he's going to begin to answer those questions. He's going to begin to answer the objections. He's going to begin to answer the accusations. And these are objections that Paul himself faced in his Acts ministry. Chapter 11. Look over in chapter 11 of Romans. And we have to, when we get into chapter 11, we'll talk some about Paul's Acts ministry. Everybody kind of gets confused on that. <laughs> and you really... A lot of the confusion I just shake my head at because the verses they use don't say what they say, you know, all this stuff. And But if you look, look at chapter 11, and look at verse 11. By the way, verse 11, 12, and 13, and 14 give you an outline of the book of Acts. And we're going to look at that when we get there. If you want to know what the outline of Acts is from our perspective, the church, the body of Christ perspective, 11.11. I say then, have they, now the they is going to be Israel. Go back up to verse 7. What then? Israel hath not obtained. So Israel's the subject here. I say then, have they stumbled that they should fall? Well, did they stumble? Yeah, they stumbled over the Lord Jesus Christ being their Messiah. The rock laid in Zion, the, the cross, they stumbled over it, but they didn't fall. Notice, God forbid. So when you hear the old timers say, well, they fell here in Matthew 12 and Mark 3. They, no. Where did they fall? They, hadn't, they didn't fall at, at earthly ministry of Christ. They tripped over it. They stumbled. We're working at our house, cleaning up some stuff in, in the front yard, and I caught my foot on the edge of the curb, and you know where Rick went. Right down, bam. What did I do? I stumbled, and then I did what? Fell, you know. And so they don't, God forbid, keep reading, but rather through their fall, salvation, through what? Now what happened? Then they do fall. Subsequently, Acts chapter 7 is where that fall takes place historically with the stoning of Stephen. But notice the result of their fall. Salvation is what? Coming to the Gentiles. Because in Acts 9, here's Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus and a whole new message. And what's that message? Salvation is going where? To the Gentiles. Now, finish the verse, because here's Paul's ministry in the Acts period. 9 to 28. What is he doing? To provoke them to what? Jealousy. So when you see Paul, as his manner is, going into the synagogue, he's not going in there preaching Peter's gospel or the Lord's earthly ministry. He's in there doing what? Provoking them to jealousy. So when Paul, so what do you think that happened? You know Paul. You know you for all. We've all looked at Acts a few times. Did they react positively to the new message? No, they begin to lay out some pounding on him. They get the lewd men of the base resort. They go get the government against him. They don't enjoy that. So when he's in there provoking them to jealousy, 
there's some accusations that come, some questions, some objections. And you know what? If you've talked to anybody about the word rightly divided, what happens to you? Do they hug you or love you? Not at all, man. They're going to pound you. What do you mean? He's, he's not dealing with Israel like he had for, you know, well, before Paul, 2,000 years. What do you, I mean, think about that. Think about Israel. 2,000 years, they've been God's chosen people. And now all of a sudden, they've been what? Cut off, separated, accursed from God. They, oh, come here, Paul, let's give you a hug and stab him in the back. Why? Because that's what, so the information here, the doctrine here in chapters 9, 10, and 11 is really coming from uh, a, a result of Paul's Acts ministry where he's communicating information to not only the Gentiles, but also to the nation of Israel. And that information to Israel is, you've been cut off. Or you, 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 look in verse 12, 11, 12. Now if the fall of them be the riches of the world, and the diminishing of them be the riches of the Gentiles, how much more there? You see, he doesn't just say, you, he, you fell. He says, you've diminished away. You're nothing. I, I, verse 13, for I speak to you Gentiles, and as much as I am the apostle of the Gentiles, I magnified my office, if by any means I may provoke to, you see that word emulation? Everybody stumbles over that. The, the dictionary definition is the act of attempting to be equal or excel. What's he trying to get Israel to understand? That they've got to be like the Gentiles now. And how, how, did they, how does that happen? It's by believing in the death, burial, and resurrection of Christ. When you go out and tell them, tell people that, they don't like you. So what do they begin to do? They begin to then raise objections. They're going to raise uh, uh, questions. And, and literally what's going to happen here, go back there to chapter 9, is they are going to accuse God of some things. And... Uh, that's why this information here is going to be of great benefit for us to understand. When Paul talks to the Gentiles, but then he also talks to the nation of Israel, that information is so radically different. There's now been a huge change in how God is dealing with humanity, with mankind. And Paul's going to make some claims that shock the very foundation, shake the very foundation of the nation of Israel, of the prophecy program, what prophecy is built upon. And when that happens, hey, it's not all, I heard this somewhere, it's not all fairy dust and unicorns. You know, it isn't. This is going to be tough time. It's going to, there's going to be some persecutions. So in the ministry of provoking Israel to jealousy. He's going to face these objections, accusations, challenges to his new claim here of what God's doing in and with humanity. And these objections, by the way, they are very real. Uh, look over with me at first, 2 Corinthians 1. They're very real. 2 Corinthians chapter 1. If you look there at verse 8, For we would not, brethren, have you ignorant of our trouble, which came to us in Asia. This is Acts 19, historically, that we were pressed out of measure above strength and so much that we despaired even life, but we had the sentence of death in ourselves that we should not trust. See, what's, what does Paul think? Paul, what's going on here? He's at Ephesus. He's there dealing with the, the big riots, Acts 19, you know, great as Diana and Ephesus and all that stuff. What, what are these guys trying to do to him? Kill him. Shut him up. So these are very real. They're very, they're, they're very impactful. And yet in 9, 10, and 11 here, you can go back there, Paul's going to give us the answer to each of these objections that are going to come. And because of what God's declaring here with the Apostle Paul, that Israel is no longer the favored nation, they have been legally and judicially 
separated, cut off. That word accursed, in Galatians he uses it, it means to be separated, to cut off from God. So what happens then in these chapters is then the word, the little thing called, you're, well, you guys are anti-Semitic. You know what that means? Against the Jews. And the Bible is anti-Semitic. And I'm like, huh? 98% of the Bible is for the Jews. Just a little bit here. We're, well, why would, and by the way, we're going to talk about that as we go through here. Because when you read 9, 10, and 11, what does it appear to be? The Jews are no more. They're separated. They're accursed. They're count- so when we start talking about that and teaching about it, then what gets thrown at us? One of the accusations is you're anti-Semitic. And that could be what? Furthest from the truth. Look there at verse 3. I'm, I'm sorry, 9-3. What does he say? I, w- I could wish that myself were... Well, wait till we get into that. I could wish. Do you know that Paul could never be accursed from Christ? But he sure had a what? Man, if I could convert... You look at chapter 10, verse 1. Brethren, my heart's desire and prayer for God, to God for Israel is that they might be what? Saved. Paul's gospel. He says, man, I'd give it all for that. Now, he can't. But boy, he sure, boy, look at his heartbeat in this. This isn't an anti-anything. It's a, hey... Verse 3, there, 9 3, for I wish I could wish that myself were a curse from Christ for my brethren, my kinsmen according to the flesh. And that's really where what we're going to learn here is that God has legally, judiciously cut off Israel to go do something with the Gentiles, with all of humanity, really. And then we're going to find out that he is right in doing it. He doesn't violate anything. He's able to go and to do. So when we study these out, again, we'll, we'll look at them and we'll find out that that anti-Semitic claim is not the case. Paul would rather than be saved. I've worked with Jewish people in my past work life at, at the grocery store. And you know what? I don't go up there and give them the old shalom, hello, blah, 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 you know. I say, hey, you're a sinner. You're going to hell. You need to get saved. They go, wait a minute. I'm of the, I go, I don't, you know, boom. And I get in big arguments with them because what did I do? I made them on the same level as me in God's eyes. Well, in God's eyes, what are we? We are on the same level. We are sinners. And so when we come into this, we're going to find out some information here. And again, prior to Acts 9, nothing in Scripture would lead anyone to think that Israel would be cut off, would be separated from God. But now, after Acts 9, when Paul now says, guess what? They are. Come over to Galatians. Uh, um, Galatians 5. Paul says they are cut off from God, legally and judicially. You know what happens? Woo! Big blow-ups, right? Get Galatians 5 and get 2 Peter 3. 2 Peter 3, Galatians 5. Look at Galatians 5. Notice Paul, verse 1. Galatians 5, verse 1. Stand fast, therefore, in the liberty with Christ, wherewith Christ hath made us free, and be not entangled again with the what? The yoke of bondage, he's demonstrated through chapter 7 of Romans, as well as in other passages with, to the Galatians, that the law is a what? It's a yoke of bondage. So when he says that, what are we talking about? We're talking about God's attitude, God's viewpoint about what the law is now. What is it? A yoke of bondage. Look back at chapter 4. Look at verse 9. Chapter 4, verse 9. But now, after that ye have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements, whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? Ye observe days, months, times, and years. He's talking about the law. Look at God's estimation of the law. What has he done with the law? He's nailed it to the cross. It's been satisfied. It's not the issue anymore. Romans 7, right? Please shake your head, yes. You know, my dad used to say, let me see you shake your head yes, because I can't hear your head rattle. You know, like, yes, sir. 
Say yes. Yes, sir. Okay. But see, the thing is, is now go back to chapter 5. Watch Paul. Verse 2, Behold, I, Paul, say unto you, that if ye be circumcised, Christ shall profit you, what? Nothing. Verse 3, For I testify again to every man that is circumcised, that he is a debtor to do the whole law. Christ has become of no effect unto you. Whosoever of ye are justified by the law, ye are fallen from... What did he just do? He just told the nation that the Mosaic law is what? It's gone. It's null and void. Go back to Acts 13. Hold on. You can let five go. We're going. We're getting there. Acts 13. Hold on to 2 Peter 3. Acts 13. Paul stands in uh, verse 16, and he begins to speak and preach the first recorded message that we have in his earth, in Paul's ministry, is right here in Acts 13. And it's fascinating that it is a historical breakout of the nation of Israel. One of the five or six passages in Scripture that gives the history of Israel. He starts here. He, he begins in verse 17. The God of this people of Israel chose our fathers. And then he, 40 years of wonderness, 18. Nine, you go down there to... Oh, verse 27, for they that dwell at Jerusalem and their rulers, because they knew him not, nor yet the voices of the prophets, which are read every Sabbath, they have fulfilled them in condemning him. Now we're at Calvary. I mean, you got him. Boom. Now look over at verse 38. Okay. By the way, you've got Calvary. You've got Pilate, verse 28. You've got the resurrection in verse 30. You've got the Acts ministry in verse 31, 32, 33, 34, 35, 36, 37. There's the Pentecostal church, the Acts ministry. Verse 38, be it known unto you, brethren, uh, uh, therefore men and brethren, that through this man is preached unto you the what? The forgiveness of sins. By the way, the, this man, that's the Lord, Okay. And by him, all that believe are justified from all things. Now, we'd have been okay if he just stopped there. But notice how he finishes the verse. From which ye could not be justified by the law of Moses. Now, what do you think that did to the crowd? It stirred them up, didn't it? So much so that verse 45, But when the Jews saw the multitudes, they were filled with envy and spake against those things which were spoken by Paul, contradicting and blaspheming. They didn't sit there, well, praise God, we got forgiveness in the death, burial, and resurrection of the Lord. What'd they focus in on? Paul just condemned Israel, the law. He said, you guys are no longer, you've been cut off. You've been separated. By the way, now go to 2 Peter 3. What happens later in Acts? Paul shows up to James. And James says, look at all these devout people are following the law, and they don't like you because of some things you were saying about against the law. So go up here and do this and that, and Paul does, but and there's reasons for that. But look at 2 Peter 3. Peter, answering the scoffer question of how long, why, is it, why, is every, why didn't his coming come? Verse 4, where is the promise of his coming? Verse 9, in that answer, the Lord is not slack concerning his promise, as some men count slackness, but is long suffering to usward, not willing that any should perish, but that all should come to repentance. So Paul or Peter introduces this issue of long the long suffering. So verse 15, an account that the long suffering of our Lord is salvation. All right? Long suffering. Even as our beloved brother Paul, also according to the wisdom given unto him, hath written unto you, and also in all his epistles. So Peter says, you want to understand this long suffering, you need to go read Paul. He wrote it to you. He wrote. He wrote epistles. But watch the warning in verse 16. Speaking in in them of these things in which are some things hard to be what? Understood. Now, can you go back to Acts 13 in your mind and what did he and Galatians 5 and what did he just say? Your program is it's of no effect. 
Christ is worthless to you in that program now. Oh, come here, Paul. Let's hug him. No, let's kill him. Get him. That's why he says there, which they that are unlearned and unstable rest, as they do also the other scriptures unto their what? Their own destruction. That's the closest verse that I can find where Peter says you need to rightly divide the word of truth. Is that verse right there. Russell, get it all spaghettied up. It would have been interesting if the Holy Spirit had said some things are hard, which they, and unstable. Spaghetti it all up, you know. Because yeah, I think about the, you know, real wrestling, you know, the Roman Greco, get them in there. And what are they? I'm amazed that they don't break stuff more frequently. Anyway, go back to Romans 9. So when we get into this, nothing prior to Acts 9 ever gave an inclination that Israel one day would be separated from their chosen favored position with God. Acts 9, Paul gets up and says what? You lost it all. He's, God is doing something else. He's right. He's judicial and doing it legally. He's not violating anything, okay? By the way, Acts is written by who? Luke. Luke's perspective in Acts is to give the details, okay? To give a written indictment against the nation of Israel for their failure to obey God's word under their program. And then their failure to obey God's word to them from the Apostle Paul under the new program. Because just as you and I are sitting here today, you know, by the way, a Jew is also a what? He's the son of Adam. He's just a man, a a human. You know as well as I know, as well as we're sitting here, that at the great white throne judgment, when they present themselves, because they're sinners, that they're going to claim what? Abraham, they're going to claim it. Well, I'm Isaac. I'm of Jacob. I'm of this. I'm, I'm actually of the tribe of Judah. And Jesse is my 10th great-grandpa. They're, you know they're going to pull that card. Why? Because you would. Well, no, I wouldn't do that, Rick. Yeah, you would. So what's going to happen? The Lord's going to say, well, here's the book that's judging everything. And by the way, you missed this first seven chapters of Acts. And you, you missed the, you know, and he's just going to let the word of God do the, do the judging. Now, in Acts 9. In Acts 9, give a quick a little overview here of each. Acts 9, Paul is going to demonstrate how it is that Israel's program has been suspended. How did it happen? Okay, In chapter 10, Paul's going to demonstrate how it is that Israel continues to stumble and falter over even today in the dispensation of grace. Okay? How did it, how, the hows, whys, look at what they're doing even today. What are they doing? They're still stumbling. They still fall over it. And then in chapter 11, Paul will describe Israel's present situation, and also he's going to present the fact that Israel does ultimately retain their future hope. Yea, all those in Israel, what? Shall be saved. So he's going to demonstrate some things. I try to keep the outline, the overview a little basic. <laughs> you know, I, I was, Romans 9, Israel's past, 10 present. 11 future, that works. But when we get into the weeds here and into it, there's some things here that Paul's going to answer because what did he face in his Acts ministry? Every one of these. What do you and I face? Every one of these. If you talk to, if you open your mouth and talk to people. Okay? So today, this morning, the rest of the time, we're just going to look at chapter 9. I'll give you a, brief, a little outline, a very basic outline about what we're gonna, what's going to happen here in chapter 9, okay? So again, chapter 9, he's going to demonstrate how it is that Israel's program is suspended. Chapter 10, how Israel continues to stumble, even today, 
in the dispensation of grace. And in verse 11, he's going to say, yet they still have a future hope. They still get their program completed out. Okay? Chapter 9, the 1 to 5. Let's write it up here. 1 to 5. Okay? Paul is going to demonstrate that Israel is accursed, is cut off, is separated from God judiciously, legally. Okay? Look, if you will, with me. That, that's what he's going to do. He's going to, the first five verses, verse 4, who are Israelites, to whom pertaineth, and then he lists everything they get they're, they're, that's theirs. Okay? So the question then, really, that results from that is why? Are they legally, judiciously cut off? Why is that? Why is that the case? So, from 9, 6 to 13, is the first objection. It's the first accusation. And that is, if you look at verse 6, not as though the word of God hath, what, taken none effect, for they are not all Israel which are of Israel. So the first objection is, is God's word must be then, what? Unreliable. That's the first objection. When you and I talk to someone, so God's word is unreliable. What do, what do usually people say to you? Well, God's, that's not what God's Word says, right? And they start pulling verses out of the thin blue sky. The problem, and what Paul's going to do now in verse 7 to 13, is he's going to say the problem is not God's Word. The problem is with Israel. That's the problem. The, accusa- the objection is, is God's Word must be unreliable, Paul answers it in verse 7 to 13, and he says, you know what? The problem is not Israel. I'm I'm sorry, the problem is not God's word. The problem is you, Israel. That's the problem. Nine, four, uh, the second, how far down did it go? 18. 14 through 18, here's the second objection. Verse 14, what shall we say then? Isn't that an interesting question? Is there what? Unrighteousness with God. God forbid. So the second objection then is what? God is what? Unrighteous. So not only is it unreliable, now he's unrighteous. Notice that verse 14. What was the answer to their objection? God forbid. They say, God is just, but he's not being fair. And have, I've heard that one before. Well, God is just, yeah. Yeah but he's just not being fair. He's not being fair to Israel by cutting them off. It's just not right. So then God must be what? Unrighteous. Right? Well, watch Paul answer them. (laughs) In verse 15, for he saith to Moses, see that? He goes in, and from in verse 17, for the scripture saith unto Pharaoh. Isn't that interesting? Verse 18, he's quoting Exodus. Paul goes and answers them, and he begins to demonstrate that God does what he does based upon his what? Mercy and grace. Look at verse 15. 
For he saith to Moses, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy, and I will have compassion on whom I will have compassion. He's not being unrighteous. He's being what? Fair. He is being judicial. He is being righteous. And what Paul's going to demonstrate as we go down through 15 to 18 there in the, in, in the text here is that when God does what he does based upon his wisdom and mercy and his plan and his purpose and his grace. Now, I threw in a bunch of other ones there because that's what the next objection is going to be. And he's going to begin to work through some history of Israel. He goes back to Moses. He's going to go back here uh, in a minute to, to the potter's clay. He's, he begins to pick historical events out of Israel's past. And he's demonstrating, no, Paul, God is right on. That then brings, well, okay, but then from 19 down to 29... Here's the third, the, the yeah butters. Look at verse 19. Thou wilt say then unto me, why doth he yet, what, find fault? He's unreasonable. Why does he find fault? You're telling us, that God is going to deal with whoever he needs to deal with based upon mercy and grace, then let God, why didn't God deal with Israel on the basis of mercy and grace? Why would God cause the nation of Israel's program to be suspended, to be interrupted? Why not just go on and finish Israel's program, which, by the way, most mainline Christianity thinks he did, and then introduces the church, the body of Christ, to fulfill out the rest of Scripture from Acts on. You know that. You understand that. The Reformed theology guys do that. Uh, you, you, anyone, that you, anyone in mainline Christianity does that because they say, see, the church started in Acts 2, and that's what we are, and Peter's and all the stuff. And it's like, wait a minute, you missed Acts 9. Because you got a guy sitting there saying, Everybody out there that's of Israel is what? Done. You lost your favored status. You, you guys follow? Okay. So they say he's unreasonable. And Paul's going to demonstrate. By the way, when they say, w w w w verse 19, why doth he yet find fault? If he's dealing with a man on mercy and grace, why does he keep finding fault with us then? <laughs> he's what? He's unreasonable. And Paul's going to, in his answer, demonstrate that God has a right to carry out his new plan according to his wisdom and purpose and mercy and grace. And what God's communicating to Israel via the new apostle Paul is that God is not being unreasonable. He has a new plan. He's got a new objective. He's got a new purpose. He has a new creature, a new agency that he's got to get some things done with before he... By the way, at the end of Israel's program, prophecy program, what happens to this earth? It's Second Peter, or First Peter, it's dissolved away. So if he finished out Israel's program, he would have no place to go to get the agency that's going to fill up the heavenly places, does he? Well, think about it. Israel needs to come to this cold realization, hard facts, that God in his wisdom, purpose, plan, declared her to be separated, to be cut off from any of her privileges, any of her advantages, in order for God to go do something new. That's why he'll use, the again, the illustration of the potter's clay. The potter's house goes back. Look at that. It's there. That's why he's going to go to Moses. He's going to go and talk about David. He's going to go talk about Abraham. He's going to go talk about Israel's history. He doesn't just 
pull things out of the midair, but rather this is the situation here. And what God through Paul, what he's saying is, is I separated you because I have the right to do it. Because I have the right to go do something else now that will ultimately bring glory and honor to who he is for all of eternity. You follow that? These are real objections, by the way. I have encountered all of them. In one conversation with a gentleman that was a card-toting, synagogue-going Jewish man, he threw every one of these at me, and I'm like, holy cow. And I was, you know, young, you know, young, grown, vigorous, and ready to, let's go to battle. And uh, literally, he ate my lunch for one conversation. <laughs> Not after that, but, the, you know. Why? And he pulled this stuff right out. He looked at me, and he said, oh, you go buy that King James Bible, don't you? And I hadn't said a word about it. I go, yeah, I do. He goes, that's a Gentile Bible. That Bible's not of God. So that word that you're using that you call to be the word of God is what? Not the word of God. Because see how, see how anti-Semitic it is? I'm like, whoa, back up here, dude. First of all, what is anti-Semitic? <laughs> I had to go look that word up. So I, you, know, I don't tra you don't travel in those conversations. Then you, you know, it's like the first time the guy used ecclesiastical on me. I'm like, you mean Ecclesiastes? Oh, I know that. No, Ecclesiastes. I'm like, what is that? I had to go look it up. <laughs> you know, all this stuff. That's what we're getting at here. Paul is going to go back into that Old Testament. He's going to demonstrate that there is a precedent that has already been established on how God deals with Israel. So really, Israel should have never been surprised. Come back with me. Just Oh, you got to see this. Go back to Acts 15. I, I think about this, and by the way, a lot of this is not even in my notes, So, yeah. but because you get going, and you, look at Acts 15. The last time we see Peter in the book of Acts, he's giving Paul and Barnabas the right hand of fellowship that they're going to go to the heathen, and they'll go to the circumcision. So where did you think, where do you think Peter... The head, the chiefest of the apostles, what do you think he thinks God's doing now? The other, the church, the body of Christ. Yet we get people who are wonderful people, you know, lovely people, and they get so twisted with this stuff. And here's Peter, the guy that they're going to champion, and you know what he says? Don't come here, go there. Okay, look at Acts 15. Peter gets up and speaks there, verse uh, 7 down verse 13 uh, and after they had held their peace James answered saying men and brethren hearken unto me this is James the half brother of the Lord he's the the pastor we would say at the Jerusalem church there in and in, in church at, at Jerusalem now watch what he says Simon hath declared how God at the first did what visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Do you see that word visit? Is visit permanent or temporary? It's temporary. What did, who did he visit of the Gentiles to call out a people after his own name? Abraham. Abraham was a card-carrying Gentile. And what did he do? He reached over, temporarily dealt with Abraham, mercy and grace and peace and long-suffering, and then boom. Peter's already told them, guys, we have precedent here. Verse 15, and to this agree the words of the prophet, as it is written. After this I will return and will uh, build again the tabernacle. And, on, and it goes on down. But Peter said, now Paul in Acts 9, you know what he's going to say? There's precedent here, guys. Come back to Acts 9. There's precedent here. And you, um, <laughs> you need to be reminded of this, Israel. Because what is, what is Israel seeing? New program. Got to go. Then you have, so again, Paul. Then you have the end of the chapter. 930. It's 33, isn't it? 33. Okay? And that's simply the conclusion. Think about the Apostle Paul. Philippians 3. Who is he? He's a Pharisee. 
He's a Hebrew of the Hebrews, tribe of Benjamin, right? Of the law, blameless. What, a, what better spokesman for the Lord to have to look at Israel and say, you are done. You've been interrupted. You've been suspended. You and I, we can't say Galatians 5, the stuff we read a minute ago. Do you know why? We were never a Jew. Only Paul can say what he said in such a manner. Now, we do say on circumc- our circumcision availeth nothing. That's not how he said it. Only Paul could, because what was Paul? He was a circumcised Jewish of the right wing conservative group of the Pharisees. Okay? All right. Romans 9. So, again, up to verse 29 here, verse 30, what shall we say then? Notice the question. Now we're going to have the conclusion of the matter. Paul, up to this point, Israel, you shouldn't be shocked if God goes and does something different. Look at your history. Again, Acts 15, Peter. Now watch verse 30. What shall we say then? That the Gentiles would follow not after righteousness, have attained to righteousness, even the righteousness which is of faith. But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness, hath not attained to the law of righteousness. Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith, as it were, by the works of the law. For they stumbled at that stumbling stone, as it is written, Behold, I say, and he quotes Isaiah 8, I lay in Zion a stumbling stone, a rock of offense, and whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. What is the conclusion? The problem is not God and God's word. The problem is You guys are a bunch of sinners. The problem lies with you guys. That's the sum of the matter. Okay? Now, next week we'll do chapter 10. No, I'm just kidding. You ain't off that lucky. This is lesson 95, and we're just in 9. So, you know, hunker down. We're going to be here for a while. What does Paul do? Paul begins with something so radically different, and yet he ends with this as the conclusion. What shall we say then? Come to the same conclusion that Paul has come to. That the problem is not God's word being unreasonable or God being unrighteous or God being uh, unreliable. It's not that at all. The problem is you are a son of Adam, Israel. You're a sinner. And you need to go get back in chapters 1 to 5 and get that settled. The conclusion is clear. So, when you hear people use this and rail against you, what have they missed? The conclusion. You see, the conclusion, the problem has never been with God. By the way, don't ever accuse or or, uh, don't ever assume that God is being unreasonable or unfair or that his word is no good. I'll be honest with you. I would never, and I hope you would have the same thought, I would never ask for God to deal with me on the basis of fairness. Because what do I deserve? Yeah. Wrath, hell, the lake of fire. So when someone goes, oh, he's not being fair, ah, you sure you want him to be fair? (laughs) What do you want him to be? Long-suffering, merciful, gracious. So Paul here in chapter 9, as we begin to get going, is going to demonstrate that everything that God is doing in Israel's life and in his program and so forth, is in keeping in line with his righteousness, with his holy character. He's not violating anything that would offend or contradict who he is. Because ultimately, really, what are they saying? God's a liar. That's what they're saying. God lied. So you can't trust a liar. See, don't you know that? Yeah, I know that. I understand, you know. That's why honesty is the best policy, (laughs) So the conclusion ultimately here is that God is revealing a new program, and he has the right to do it. And he has the right to go sin, to go be gracious to who? 
the Gentiles. And again, you read the end of Acts 28 there. He had them going until he mentioned the word Gentile. And then they blew up all over him again. Now, the question comes, again, where we started. There's something in all of this that Israel, and by the way, Israel struggled with this. And they couldn't stomach the new message. They couldn't stomach Paul. They can't stomach you. If you honestly, if you go talk to someone who is a devout Jew, they don't like you. They don't like the New Testament. They don't like the Lord Jesus Christ. They walk why? Because in their understanding and their belief system, what? He's not their Messiah. They're still waiting for the guy on the white stallion to come back. Why? Because they stumbled, didn't they? They missed that low and meekly coming. By the way, the prophets told them he's going to do that. They missed that. So they struggled that. And again, we today also have those same struggles. And again, we have to grasp this information. There's stuff in here... In 9, 10, 11, that'll just take your brain and go, and you go, huh? And you got to remember where we're at. So the question then ultimately, and I got like 10 minutes maybe, to answer the question of why then does Romans 9, 10, and 11 sit here after, the, after 8 and before 12? Natural progression from 8 to 12. Why is it inserted here? And it is a wonderful thing to grasp. What did we just learn about in, in Romans 8, verse 35 to 39? What did we just see? Look at 8, 38, 5. What sh who shall separate us from the love of Christ? Shall tribulation or persecution or distress or famine or nakedness or peril? Or we, 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 saw all of, we saw the opposition, didn't we? We saw the Potential trial areas. Verse 38 and 39, we see who the opposition is and where the adversary is and where the opposition comes from. So who opposes your justification and who opposes your identification? Okay, that's, well, who does that? Religion does that. Now, I know we got Satan back there, but he isn't sitting here going, rrr, rrr. He's using a what? A system, isn't he? Remember Galatians 5.1? Stand fast in the liberty. There's our justification and identification. And be not entangled again with the what? Yoke of bondage. What did Galatians do? They went back underneath that law program. What did they do? They went back to religion. So when you think about this issue here of why does it sit right here? Who's going to oppose you in your life, in your moment right now? And that's what Paul's talking about. The opposition here that's going to come against you is going to come from a theological objection, a theological argument, a theological resistance against dispensational Bible study, if I can say it that way. Who does that? The religion category. Okay, you follow, I, we, I don't want to run a bunch of verses, but that's what's happening here. In nine, so Paul take he's going to bring he's talking about opposition. Who opposed Paul in Paul's ministry? The Jews did. Religion did. Remember when he goes into Ephesus, and the silver guy, the silver smith, and all them can't work. Who was that? Religion. He goes up on Mars Hill. You remember Mars Hill? And he's got all those. He goes, hey, I want to talk to you about that idol you got over there marked unknown God, just to cover all the bases. And, and he gets in there. Who's opposing him? Religion does. He explains who the opposition really is. Some of you have had encounters with family. Most everybody in the room has come out of a religious background. So you learn the truth, rightly divided. You see justification's a free gift. And what do you do? You go share it, don't you? With your family. And what happens? Well, what's that? 
They love you, don't they? They say what? You sit on the other side of the, of the table. Yeah, exactly. See, but why is that? They love you, but their religious background doesn't love dispensational Bible truth. So, come, come back to Romans 12. I, I just noticed something here. So, Paul's describing for us in, in Romans 8 the areas of suffering and who is going to, those uh, agents and everything, and we saw that. Think about this. Paul leaves us at the end of Romans 8 in heavenly glorious truth about not being separated. And then he brings us right down into the dregs of the battle. Why? Because you need to know who's going to oppose you. Are you there in your Romans 12? So 9, 10, and 11 does fit where Paul has it in our edification process so that we are then equipped to handle the suffering, to handle the persecution. Because what do we know? We know it's coming. We know why it's coming. But now we can identify the who. And a little bit better than just saying it's the devil. Because when you say it's Satan, you go, hey, okay, that guy over there. But when you say it's where I used to be, Mormon, Lutheran, Catholic, Baptist, whatever, Methodist, Presbyterian, you name it. Now we're where? Now we're in some reality check here. Okay, so how do we answer the objections? How do we handle these types of questions? Paul educates us. Something else to consider, 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, and so on. Again, it's easy to skip 9, 10, 11, go right to 12.1. But... Notice how he starts 12.1. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the what? The mercies of God. Do you see that word, mercies? There's a plurality to it. Included in, in his mercies. Include the grand glorious plan that he has for the dispensation of grace. Which is how Paul ends chapter 11 how he ends section 3. Look at 11.33. Oh, the depths of the riches, both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. How unsearchable are his judgments and his ways past finding out. For who hath known the mind of the Lord? Or who hath been his counselor? Quote, quoting Isaiah 40. Or who hath first given to him and it shall be recompensed unto him again? Now watch. For of him and through him and to him are all things, to whom be glory forever. Amen. Our blessings, our power, our resources are not found because we are, what, replacing Israel. They're not found in thinking you are spiritual Israel. Rather, they're found in what? Everything God's doing today. In the age of grace, in the church, the body of Christ. All that we have, all of the, so everything God's doing is part of the mercies of God. All that we have, all that we're doing is because of who we are in Christ. At the end of Romans 8, you are, who are you? You are a son of God. Romans 9, 10, and 11, you're not Israel. You're what? A son of God. It's fascinating. In chapter 11, verse 28, as concerning the gospel, they are what? Could you imagine calling the nation of Israel an enemy? But he does. But what are they an enemy of? The gospel. Dispensational Bible truth. So it's a natural for 9, 10, and 11 to be right here. Go back up to verse 20 of chapter 11. You see, folks, we need to learn some things about Israel's history. 
I, we did a Sunday, oh man, it is time to quit. We, give me five, okay? We did a Sunday evening service on understanding Israel. It's critical to do that. Look at 1120. Well, because of unbelief, they were, what? Broken off. And thou standest by faith. Be not, what? See that high-minded? But fear? Verse 25. For I would not, brethren, that ye should be ignorant of this mystery, lest ye should be wise in your own, what? Conceits. We will never be able to live out chapters 12 through 16 with a high-minded, conceited sense of superiority. We are, if we think that we are better than Israel, and we say to God, see, you should have been using us all the time, okay? Nope, that's not how God's going to work. So we need to conclude the same things as Paul did, and we need to walk there. We need to allow the truth of God dealing with the Gentiles in grace today and to participate and, and, and to educate your inner man with sound doctrine. And what will that allow us to go do? That will allow us to go do 12-1 because we don't have a high-minded. We don't. Israel, you go back. Israel says, God got a great deal when they got me. I know some Gentiles that say the same thing. You know what Paul says in 9, 10, 11? You see how he cut him off? He can do the same to you. And you better be careful. Now, we'll start in 9-1 next time because Paul, when he says in 9-1, I say the truth in Christ, I lie not. What do you think they were throwing at him? Paul, you're a liar. And we'll talk about that next time. Folks, in order for us to live, in order for us to react to life properly, we need to understand what God's doing here with the nation of Israel. We have to. It's right here. Paul put it here. The Holy Spirit put it here. Why? So that as you come through, you'll know who your opposition is, but then you'll also know who you are not, them. Because religion says we replaced them. And this is foundational doctrine, Romans. Okay? All right. Dear Father, we thank you for the morning, Lord. We thank you for your word, and we thank you for the instructions here as we study it out and begin to look here at these critical passages that we would do so for your honor and for your glory. In your name we pray.